Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. Before I turn it over to our program director, I have just a couple of housekeeping announcements. The PowerPoint presentation, as well as the recording, will be made available at a later date. And if you have any questions of our panelists for today, if you can please put them in the, in the chat feature and make sure that you are responding to all panelists and we will answer your questions accordingly. With that in mind, I'd like to turn this webinar over to Madeline Frazier-Cook. Thank you very much. Madeline? Thank you, Jessica. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to our webinar this afternoon. This is a webinar that's part of a series on Section 108 Loan Guarantee Program through HUD. Um, we've been doing the sessions um, to really highlight how to best use the Section 108 program along with various other types of funding sources. In today's webinar, we will be highlighting a particularly successful example of using Section 108 along with opportunity zones and a variety of different types of tax credits. So we are really fortunate to be joined by the developers, the community builders that were very intimately involved in this project, as you can imagine, and we have uh, the pleasure of having Jesse Elton and Kirk Alveston um, to talk us through the project. Um, we encourage all of you to please ask questions. The, these webinars really um, are best when we have a lot of engagement with you from our, uh, our participants, um, and you can really take advantage today because we have um, on the webinar as well representatives from HUD um, in the Section 108 program who are here to help us navigate some of the more um, complicated questions related to Section 108 to just demystify the process for us as well. Um, and that's um, Jorge Morales and uh, Joey Fayetti. Um, and we're also joined by a colleague of mine, um, Jim Beachler, who has been our partner in developing this Section 108 uh, Loan Guarantee Program series. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to um, Kirk Albison, who will give us some background on this project, um, and then we'll be joined, he will be joined by Jesse, who will also walk through some of the finer points around the financing. Again, please use the, um, the chat function to send questions at any point in the presentation. We will have a Q&A session at the end, but we really encourage you to put those questions in the chat box. I'll be monitoring them. I have permission from the presenters to interrupt, um, to ask the questions. Um, so don't be shy. Um, this is a great opportunity to take advantage of the amazing amount of expertise we have around the table today. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Kirk um, and he can get us started with the program. Kirk. Great. Thanks a lot, Madeline. Thanks for having us today. Uh, brief introduction of myself and Jesse. Uh, my name is Kirk Albinson. I'm a senior project manager with the Community Builders. Uh, and Jesse Elton, if you want to make yourself visible and introduce yourself, and then I'll, I'll take it back to walk through the beginning part of the presentation. Great. Hello, everybody. I'm Jesse Elton. Um, I am the director of real estate finance at TCB and was um, Kirk's partner on this project. Great. Thanks, Jesse. Uh, well, um, just a, a quick background. Uh, the Community Builders, we're a national nonprofit real estate developer. Uh, we're based in Boston. We operate in 14 states from Chicago, D.C., Boston, everywhere in between. And we had the absolute honor of working with uh, our partners on this project, with, uh, which is the City of Aurora and the Paramount Theater. And Paramount Theater is a quasi-governmental entity under the Aurora, Aurora Civic Center Authority. Uh, Jessica, if you could go to the next slide, please. Um, so, so I'm going to give everyone just a, a little bit of the the why and the what, and then Jesse will step in to talk about the how. Um, so, Aurora, Illinois, for those that are outside of the Chicago region, Aurora is uh, west of Chicago by, by about 45 miles. Uh, it's one of the suburban communities, actually the second largest city in the state of Illinois, with uh, over 200,000 uh, people. 
And uh, during its heyday 100 plus years ago, uh, it is like a lot of uh, industrial cities in the Midwest where um, it was the place to be. Uh, it was a destination. And as the decades rolled on, as, as uh, heavy industry moved out, and as the suburbs swallowed a lot of these communities in the collar counties of Chicago, it lost its way and uh, experienced what a lot of communities, uh, mid-sized communities in industrial Midwest experienced just uh, disinvestment uh, and folks moving out of town and just, you know, a lot of challenges uh, that are not necessarily unique to this one area. Fortunately though, um, uh, the city and a lot of the civic leaders and, and private uh, individuals over the last 20, 30 years has spent considerable amounts of effort and money investing into the downtown. And Jessica, if you can go to the next slide. And it's really been exciting seeing the amount of investment in the downtown. Uh, next slide, Jessica. Yeah, I'm just having a, a little problem with, yep. okay, there we go. No problem, there, there we go. go. Got uh, it. Here's just a map of the downtown. Um, it's too hard to see, but there's been literally hundreds of millions of dollars of investment in downtown. And TCB had the opportunity uh, a number of years ago to be asked by the city of Aurora to come in and see if we could uh, help participate in that revitalization re revitalization effort, which is a, a definitely a part of our mission. Just get to go to the next slide, please. And so the Aurora today is just uh, absolutely an exciting place to be. It's just a wonderful community with, you know, partly because of the strong investment, but a lot because of the commitment from the community to uh, stay in the downtown, to reinvest in that community. It's really a lot of fun, everywhere from uh, civic, uh, new civic investments like uh, the new library at the top, the uh, River Edge Park, which is part of the Paramount Theater that I mentioned in below, and, and really a lot of the success of the downtown in terms of its notoriety, notoriety in the region is because of the Paramount Theater. And they brought in a new CEO and artistic director, uh, Tim Rader and Jim Cordy, who have completely in the last 10 years turned around Paramount Theater to be truly uh, an absolute gem in the theatrical scene in the Midwest. Now, if you can go to the next slide, Jessica. So uh, the project that we embarked on, I'm, I'm gonna give you an overview of of the overall project, and then we're going to dive into the weeds on one specific aspect of uh, one of the buildings. The project we embarked on actually had uh, two buildings, you know, Coulter Court, which you can see there on the bottom right of the screen, and then the Aurora Art Center, uh, which is the main focus of today's conversation. If you go to the next slide, uh, Jessica, and these, both these buildings are in the downtown. Coulter Court is uh, the preservation of 38 existing affordable apartments that were in the downtown that was a beautiful, gorgeous, historic building. Um, although the property was struggling financially because of its its size and it's, it's uh, just not being balanced operationally, uh, uh, it was a beautiful building, well run, uh, great residence. And so we were able to pair that with uh, the Aurora Art Center project uh, which we in the city and the Paramount Theater conceived, which uh, I'll explain in a minute, actually has 38 artist law style apartments on the upper two floors, which was a part of this LIHTC transaction, a low income housing tax credit transaction that we paired with the Culture Court project or building. Uh, and then the balance of the project at the Aurora Art Center, which is the majority of the first floor and the lower level, uh, was uh, performed through a new markets tax credit transaction uh, that includes a school, a restaurant, uh, Paramount moved their rehearsal spaces over, uh, and um, um, some other functions that help support the arts in the community. You go to the next slide, Jessica. Uh, so right there's a, a shot of the Aurora Arts Center right in the heart of downtown. It's actually on an island that uh, the Fox River uh, flows through the downtown uh, immediately adjacent to the Paramount Theater, um, which is a, a, uh, in a great location, draws over 400,000 patrons a year. Um, and if you go to the next slide, Jessica. And just a, a quick lay of the land with the layout of the building, again, the upper two floors, which were the lower two plans on this image, uh, consist of the 38 lost style apartments. Uh, the upper two, or I'm sorry, the lower two floors, the first floor and the lower level, which is the upper two plans on the uh, the slide, consists primarily of, of the Paramount School of Arts, the Paramount Rehearsal Spaces, and uh, uh, a, a 
a fine dining restaurant to serve the patrons uh, in the downtown, primarily focused on uh, the theater uh, crowd. And Jessica, you can go to the next slide. Uh, it was quite a jigsaw puzzle, uh, and it would be worthy of a whole separate discussion talking about doing a historic adaptive reuse of an 80,000 square foot, uh, originally designed as a, a department store and converting that into a, 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 an arts-focused mixed-use building where we added not just apartments, which weren't necessarily easily uh, adaptable to a deep floor plate, but also adding in uh, very um, key uh, performance spaces, whether it be rehearsal spaces, flex studios, dance studios, where we had certain structural requirements to, to tend to. So it was a, quite a design challenge. Jessica, you can go to the next slide. So this slide, and, and Jessica, if you go to the next slide, actually um, just show some of the some of the from a construction standpoint, some of the complexity that was involved in the project where we had to peel back uh, decades of you know, layers of the onion, so to speak, to uncover the original structure. And, and once we have, <laughs> once the project was underway, we, you know, the, the structural uh, portion of the building wasn't how we and our engineers and architects had assumed. So there was a lot of rework going on. And oh, by the way, if you look at the bottom right image where we had to actually dig down in the basement of the building, uh, we were on an island, uh, literally at the water table, and we had to create a bathtub to be able to dig down. Um, so a lot of challenges. It's a lot of fun to talk about, uh, obviously, after the project is complete. But um, nonetheless, um, we were able to get through that. And Jessica, to go to the next slide, uh, we were able to, to finish the project. So I'm not going to go through all the details here, but the residential pro program, which is a part of the low-income housing tax credit project, uh, which included 38 uh, lost style apartments, all affordable. Uh, and if you go to the next slide, uh, it, the, the amenities and the apartments were all designed with the arts in mind. So we have an art gallery. The units are all larger, um, fortunately, to our benefit because of that deep floor plate. And if you go to the next image, uh, Jessica, but we have a collaboration lab for uh, artists that are involved in uh, some of the visual arts, digital arts. We have a movement studio. Uh, not shown here, we have actually music uh, and sound practice rooms, um, individual practice room. We have one that's large enough to hold a four-piece band. And so a lot of the amenity, amenities were designed specifically for artists. Uh, next slide. And here's just a, a shot of just some of the, the uh, finished apartments uh, prior to residents moving in. Um, but uh, a lot of light, we benefited from those windows um, and a lot of space and great finishes. Next slide. And then the commercial program, which now we're getting into the focus of today's discussion, uh, this was originated through a new markets tax credit transaction, which Jesse will uh, dive into the weeds here shortly and talking about the Section 108 loan. Uh, but it includes a school of arts that the Paramount was one of their goals when Tim Ryder and Jim Cordy uh, joined with the Paramount Theater to open a school of arts, which is over 20,000 square feet and um, over 30 uh, individual and group classrooms in addition to a flex studio, a dance studio, and other uh, um, performing arts related spaces. In addition to that, there's uh, Paramount Theater moved all their rehearsal spaces into the building uh, to accommodate their, their growing Broadway production series. As I mentioned earlier, we've got a fine dining restaurant located in the building. And actually, in the back of the building, we've got a really neat amenity for Paramount Theater. We have four extended stay suites for visiting performers. Uh, next slide, Jessica. Uh, and here's just some completed images of the project. Uh, Flex City on the top left. There's some neat amenity spaces for the school. You can see these other images. And the next slide. And then the, the fine dining restaurant, which actually is really um, turned out to be a wonderful gem to the downtown community, uh, where uh, the downtown was, was a revitalizing community, had, had been lacking a lot of fine dining any fine dining options in the downtown to serve um, the huge draw of the theater uh, on, a, on a, week, uh, a nightly basis. All right, so next slide. Um, so here's, uh, we start getting into the fun part. So this project would not have been possible if it weren't for literally the, the, um, the, the considerable support and effort from so many different stakeholders. You know, the, the number one was the partnership between the city of Aurora, Paramount Theater, and the community builders and the leads. But then also the support of all these different organizations you'll see as we talk about some of the financing in here. But it was truly a Herculean effort uh, with many twists and turns in the story. But um, it was exciting.
exciting to have the best of breed with all these organizations, including HUD, including our local township, uh, including uh, our investors and lenders. Um, it, was, it was quite impressive. So next slide, Jessica. So uh, you can go to the next one. So financing, I'm gonna, I'm gonna here's where I'm gonna segue to, to Jesse Elton, our, our director of finance. Um, I like to humorously um, to start lay out the, uh, the organization or the flow chart on these two transactions. On the right side of the page is the residential project, which is the low income housing tax credits. And the left side of the, uh, the slide is the commercial project, which is primarily um, through a new markets tax credit structure. And simply put, I like to say, you know, for those that know uh, residential financing and uh, LIHTC financing, the right side of the page, that image shows our organization chart, and that's simply put, uh, to quote the uh, a PSA announcement of anti-drug announcement, that's your brain. And then on the left side with the new markets tax credits, that's your brain on drugs. Uh, and that's the effort that <laughs> I'm gonna now pass it to Jesse to unpack and unravel the spaghetti <laughs> diagram of how this transaction was put together. Thank you, Kirk. Yes, I have the pleasure of talking about the brain on drugs portion of this uh, dialogue. That is kind of how how is the sausage made here. Um, we'll start on the next side, slide, please, um, where we are blowing up what you just saw, the same diagram that you would see on the left side of the page, which is the commercial um, diagram showing the ownership structure of the different entities involved here, owners and financial partners, I should say, and the flow of funds. So we'll use this to kind of orient everybody to those topics. I think the best place to start on a diagram like this is to find the owner. And on this diagram, the owner is the Qualic B in New Market Speak, that's the uh, qualified active low income community business um, that you can see right below the red arrow. So that's the entity that owns the project and that needed to have all, its, all the money aggregated to pay the contractor to pay all the other development related expenses. So as we work our way up, we're gonna be talking about, well, where does the money come from and kind of what is the path it takes to get into the hands of that Qualic B. And the next place to go is the box labeled leverage lender, which is at the very top of the page in the middle. And there's a blue and a yellow arrow pointing to it. And those two arrows are talking about where money is coming in. Now the leverage lender is the entity where Funds, funds come through that entity, it's sort of the aggregator of sources that will then go through this, what we call the new market structure, um, which generates new markets credits, attracts, you know, allows the investor to have an, an, an equity investment that will generate tax benefits for that investor, and ultimately kind of makes its way down to that Qualic B so the Qualic B can pay the bills. Um, so the two arrows that point to the leverage lender are showing us the sort of two major streams of funds that are coming into the leverage lender. And the first with the blue arrow are sources from the city and a little bit, or also some sources that came from the state, from Ida. Um, and, and those are, are, are grants and soft loans that are coming in to, um, that, that are coming in to support the project. And I should say to back up the leverage lender, I didn't identify who that is. That's ACA in this legal structure. That is the sponsor of the project who Kirk mentioned um, is the operator of the School for Performing Arts. So they're the ones receiving grants, receiving some soft loans that are, that are gonna be sources of this in this project. Now, we also um, use federal historic tax cuts on this project. Kirk talked about how these are historic buildings. They were eligible for federal historic credits. And um, we wanted to go even a step further, not just use and take advantage of that equity source that could be a source to the deal, but also take that equity and bring it down through the new market structure, because by virtue of doing that, we could generate more new market tax credit equity that could then be an additional source. Um, so the yellow arrow is showing you how we took, we, we were able to syndicate the federal historic tax credits, then send them up um, through a loan structure to the leverage lender so that the leverage lender could then send them down. Um, and the series of arrows that you're seeing here in pink and green and then purple and red are showing money flowing through an investment fund. That's kind of all those sources that we've just talked about, plus the new market's equity from our investor flowing into what's called the investment fund, then flowing through two CDEs, um, community development entities. Those are entities that, um, 
are authorized by the U.S. Department of Treasury CBFI fund to give out the new markets credit um, and to make it possible for a, an investor to receive tax benefits from a project like this. So they're also part of the legal structure here, kind of the, la the last stop before the Qualic B, sending the money down to, to get to the Qualic B. So for, for folks who have, you know, seen new markets a lot, that will probably, you know, kind of um, set pretty well. And, and if, if, if you're not as familiar with new markets, I'm hoping that that gives at least an overview of, you know, a sense of where, how money is flowing here and, you know, glad to answer questions if there's things that people want to clarify with, because I know there's, there's a lot there. But that gives you a high level picture of what, of what this structure looks like. Now let's go to the next slide and um, talk about the structure uh, through a different, through a sources and uses presentation here. So on this slide, you are seeing on the left side our commercial project, the New Markets uh, Historic Tax Credit Project, Sources and Uses. And on the right side, you're seeing the Residential LIHTC Project, Sources and Uses. So I'll just focus on the commercial project and LIHTC is there for your reference. Um, so on our commercial project, you can see that our total development cost is just about 13 point, just about $13.9 million. And what comprised our sources include in that box with the dotted lines around it, that is showing all the sources that we call those leverage sources, all those sources that go in through the leverage lender that then go through that new markets tax credit structure that generates the new markets equity. Um, so here is where you can see more detail on the city and state sources that I mentioned earlier. So the first sort of portion of sources before that space in the dotted line box are all what, what, what had been the blue arrow on that prior slide. Um, and that includes, um, so the first source is actually, um, I won't go into great detail, there's so many tangents one can take with this project because there's a lot of different tax credits, but um, the first source is a tax credit that is allocated by um, the state of Illinois and uh, the, the Illinois Affordable Housing Tax Credit that actually was generated by virtue of the other, pro of the LIHTC project, but is a flexible source where we were able to generate some equity and then use it to loan to this project. So in that way, Ida was a financial participant on this side of the project as well. Um, but then most of what is below that is where you see the city sources. So in total, the city of Aurora put in $4.35 million of funding into this project. And you can see that the largest slug of that is $3 million from the Section 108 uh, program. So we'll talk certainly more in detail about that in a moment. Um, but you can also see that, that the city actually was quite creative and piecemealed together several other sources to get us up to that $4.35 million number. Um, there's CDBG in this project. There is tax increment financing in this project. And the city also identified a revenue source associated with a gaming tax um, some gaming tax revenue that they were able to direct into this project. So that's given you a bit of a sense of, again, those kind of soft sources and grant sources that were coming in. Um, and then the other source of leverage that we touched on earlier is the federal historic tax credit. So you see that at the bottom of the um, dotted line box, there's about $1.659 million of federal historic tax credit equity we could have just stopped there and changed, and our legal structure would have been simpler, but we actually kept that in that dotted line box and leveraged that source. And that is why when you go below the dotted line box, we're seeing quite a nice healthy equity number of $3.77 million of kind of gross equity. Um, I say gross because there are transaction costs um, associated with this, but I, you know, I wouldn't call the benefit of new markets 3.77, but I would call it getting close to 3 million kind of on a net basis after factoring in those transaction costs, um, that's the benefit that we really saw from the new markets project, from doing this as a new markets project. Um, as I mentioned, there's always another twist and turn with this project where we could go into many tangents, but um, right below the new markets equity, just want to explain that source. I hadn't brought up this source on the prior slide. There is one other tax credit that was used on this project, um, and that is a state historic tax credit called the Illinois River's Edge Credit. Um, that is a credit that we, there, there's actually not a legally possible way to leverage that source in a new market structure. That's a credit that needs to be taken directly by the owner entity, and we can't do the legal um, mechanism that I'll talk about in a second that we use for federal historic tax credit. So that's why you're not seeing that source in the box for leverage sources. You're seeing it as another, another line there as a separate source. But that did bring in another $1.4 million. 
Um, so that, in, in a nutshell, is our is our capital stack. And there, you know, I want to return to kind of hon homing in on two sources. Um, and the first is is going back to that federal historic tax credit equity and just talking a little bit more about the structuring that we use there. And Jessica, if you don't mind just going back to the prior slide for a moment, um, perfect. So when we talk about that federal historic tax credit source that I've mentioned a couple times here, again, to orient us, it's that yellow arrow is showing um, money coming from the syndication of federal historic credits up to the leveraged lender so that it can get into the new market structure. Um, so the three boxes there, the one that says master tenant under the yellow arrow, the one that says bridge lender to, le to the left of that, and the one that says historic investor to the left of that, all of that is needed bec because we chose to leverage the federal historic tax credits. Um, we needed to create a master lease from that owner, that Qualic B, um, because there was not a way to get the funds um, from the syndication of credits up to the leveraged lender without having a separate entity. So, you know, you take a diagram that is frankly already pretty complicated and we're adding these three boxes. And, you know, maybe three boxes sounds innocuous, but really that added quite a bit of complexity to this project. And I, um, I will say that I did not know quite what we were getting into when we did this, but what we, what we did know, we, we, you know, from a back of the envelope perspective, thought about different structures from the beginning. And we acknowledged that this structure could generate, we thought, and, and this proved out, about $600,000 of additional kind of net new market equity for this project. And that was a source we needed in order to be able to, you know, um, to complete the project. We, we needed that for financial feasibility. Um, so we went down this path. But what we learned in doing so was that, um, that it really cannot be understated how much additional complexity that did create. Um, there are a lot of tax considerations related to the way that funds need to flow, to specific considerations related to the invest, like kind of um, the terms of the investment that the federal historic um, tax credit investor needs to meet. So we have a lot of conversations between tax council. You know, there's a lot of parties on a project like this. Um, so there were a lot of um, a lot of stakeholders at the table that needed to be signing off on various tax and other kind of structuring considerations. Um, you know, just to back up, I realized I didn't identify for you all of the um, financial parties. So I'll just do that here. Um, I mentioned that there are two CDEs that allocate the new markets tax credits to this project. Um, in this case, on this project, TCB served as the developer, and that's the, capa the primary capacity that Kirk and I are speaking to you in. But TCB is actually also a CDE. Um, we have an affiliate that um, competes for the privilege to allocate new markets tax credits to projects like this one. And we're often participating in projects where we are not the developer, um, but in this case, we actually wore two hats and our CDE team was involved here as well. So we are one of the two participants, which did make things more streamlined because that's a, obviously a party that we know well. They're staffed by, uh, separately, but it's a, it's a folks that we work well with, as you'd imagine. Um, and the other CDE that participated here was BMO Harris Bank. Um, the investor on the project, and I say investor singular because we actually had the same investor for new markets and for federal historic tax credits, um, that was U.S. Bank. And they were also the LIHTC investor. So there was, um, there, there was some, some real um, efficiency in having, you know, kind of everything under one shop. You know, just like TCD had different staff for developer and CDE, U.S. Bank had different staff for their different functions. Um, but nonetheless, having it under one roof was certainly a more streamlined way to kind of get folks on the same page about decisions that needed to be made. But all of that is to say, to return to our topic of this kind of federal historic structuring, there's a lot of attorneys on projects like this, um, a lot of folks that need to be signing off, and a lot of, um, there's also, you know, for folks who have worked on, on new markets projects, you'll be familiar with this, uh, a CPA firm is retained to do a financial model. And that financial model is very lengthy, very complicated, and that, that um, they become a real essential member of the team as well. So a lot of iterative work that, um, you know, any new markets project will have, but the added, um, the addition of doing this leverage structure that we did for the federal historic really um, amplified that quite a bit, that, that, that complexity in and of itself. So that was one piece to highlight. And then the other place I want to go is our main topic of the day, Section 108. And um, let's go back to the next slide, please, Jessica, for this. Um, great. So when I thinking about Section 108 and how that was used in this project, 
is really, to me, a story about the commitment and ingenuity of the city of Aurora. We had just a phenomenal partner um, that, you know, really Kirk uh, worked with, you know, daily on, on to get this project to fruition. And the city wanted to support the project using all the tools it had at its disposal. So you see that evidence by they're identifying multiple sources that they that they brought to bear to, um, to fund this project. And early on, um, they identified that they were interested in pursuing Section 108 fund funding um, as sort of the largest slug of support that they would be bringing to the project. And I will admit that I have I started as a, as a little bit skeptical that that was going to be feasible for this project. I was aware, and, and we mutually identified this early on with the city, that this project did not have the ability to support any performing debt. And it didn't have the ability to provide a first mortgage because of the new market structure where there's already a first mortgage position committed um, to the financial parties associated with that structure. Um, so I knew that it wouldn't fit into a conventional box. Um, but the city understood that as well. And so they determined that they wanted to find alternative repayment and collateral sources um, as part of the underwriting for this loan. And, um, and then they set out and did just that. They first off went to HUD um, and requested technical assistance. And I think that that, you know, we can talk more about um, this, this as a success story of using technical assistance, but truly we all knew and the city really knew that they had a complex project on their hands and that they wanted to do some things that weren't um, done every day. Um, and so having that technical assistance was really critical, I think, to um, getting, getting them oriented in the right direction for how to pursue a structure here. Um, so then the city did the tough work internally to the, to, to, um, to, to the city government of identifying multiple city sources that they could use to serve as collateral and repayment sources for this loan since they had to look outside the project. Now, meanwhile, we were get kind of getting ready to start our closing process. We had identified our CDEs, we had new markets allocation committed, we had an investor committed, and all those parties said, well, we're ready to start a closing process, but you know, we need to know that all the sources in the deal are committed or it won't, doesn't make sense for us all to be spending all this time and funds to get ready for a closing that could implode if you know, that Section 108 funding wasn't there when we got to the closing table. Um, so the city, again, stepped up and provided a backstop guarantee. They said, we are committed to this project. We are going to make that $3 million plus the additional sources. So it really a total of $4.35 million available to this project. You can count on it. If the section, we, we will be working with HUD through the Section 108 underwriting process in parallel to other closing activities occurring. And if for some reason it's determined that the 108 is not feasible, we will find an alternative replacement source. So that was really key in terms of keeping our closing on timeline so that we didn't have to do um, these activities sequentially. Um, let's go to the next side, slide, please. And that, you know, this is a nice segue into just talking about the timing of the um, steps to get from kind of our concept to the fruition of the project opening its doors. Um, so you see, we're talking about four years, really, from concept to opening doors. And I think that um, you know, many of us on, on this call who have been in a lot of real estate projects could might, might know that our, our friends and our laymen who are not part of the development industry may think that sounds like a long time, but uh, I think m many of us know that that's actually um, record timing for a project of this type of complexity, talking about two and a half years um, to get to our closing um, from our kind of con conceptual um, origination of this project to our closing. And um, certainly, the, like I've already emphasized, the city's commitment to this project throughout, specifically the way that they handled the Section 108 and providing that backstop was really critical to the sequencing of steps and make, being able to work some parallel financing and closing processes together rather than having to do those sequentially, which could have really caused a delay. Um, we just had a lot of alignment amongst all the parties focused on a closing. And it really also helped that we had um, an outside deadline. Um, this project um, happened to, the, our closing in 2017 happened to fall just after tax reform, where we would have lost, we would have um, lost the ability to take a historic credit in one year. It would have instead been over five years and decreased the value of that credit. And there was also some questions along the way as to whether the Illinois River's Edge tax credit would still be available the following fiscal year. So we were a motivated team. We all knew that we had to close or we were gonna have a very serious funding gap that really might be insurmountable. 
Um, so we didn't really have a holiday that year, most of us, <laughs> and we we got this we got the project closed. And just I'll add to that uh, that if you look at the timeline. <laughs> Uh, during the project, we had a presidential election, and the threat of or the expectation of tax reform uh, surfaced after the city and, and uh, our, all of the stakeholders had made their funding commitments to the project, and the project literally within a span of, if folks are involved in any tax credit projects during that time frame, this project lost approximately $3 million worth of equity within about two, three weeks, and we had to go back to the drawing board while we were closing, um, we still had a long runway, but while we were closing to basically uh, have all of the stakeholders chip in and, and recommit to the project to ensure it could move forward. So just a, another hurdle that was uh, in the process. Right. I know, I almost forgot about some of the twists and turns on this project. Um, and that River's Edge credit was in both sides of the project. So we were, we've, and the two projects at this point had to close together. So there were a lot of reasons why um, there was a lot of focus in those last months of 2017 to just kind of get us there. Um, great, I think let's go to the next slide, please. Um, so just to round out, you know, to emphasize some of the themes here in terms of lessons learned that I've touched on already, I think the common theme between these two kind of key lessons learned is that on this project, in terms of the financing legal structure, we did some out-of-the-box things, some complicated things. Um, that were very successful in this project and we're really proud and, uh, of having done them. And, but they were very much premised on having great partners and a great team that were equipped to take these things on. Um, so, you know, again, the Section 108 very much dependent on our fantastic partner of the city of Aurora, that early recognition that we needed to be thinking outside the project for repayment and collateral, and that willingness on the part of the city to um, pledge to be there, even if this 108 didn't, didn't um, prove out um, as feasible given that we knew we were doing some things that were a little bit creative. Jesse? Um, yes, please. I got a question in, is the city servicing the 108 debt from our annual CDBG allocation? Great question. Um, Kirk, you know, I don't know how much detail you can speak on that. Um, I know the city has a few different repayment sources and um, I'm- There are, yep. uh, it's, uh, I can't answer whether it's coming out of just the CDBG allocation. I, I actually want to, and was qualified, and I know we actually have a city of Aurora representative on uh, that's participant, but um, there are multiple sources that are contributing to the repayment uh, of the Section 108 loan. Uh, like Jesse showed in the sources of music, we, there are two TIFs involved in the project. Um, there's other revenue sources tied to the success of the restaurant. Um, there is parking revenue that's generated uh, from actually the, the residential development. Uh, where the residents, there's there's no parking on site, so there's there's a city owned parking ramps. So there's there's a multitude of repayment sources that are coming through to pay back the one away loan. But I unfortunately I just can't answer specifically about the CDBG as being a repayment source. This is <clears throat> this is Joey. Uh, I think that also brings up a good point. Just to chime in here, uh, Section 108 does allow for multiple repayment sources. So if um, like what's mentioned here, if there's parking revenue, um, but that doesn't quite get you all the way there for your annual payment, then obviously we accept CDBG and other sources of repayment. So oh. there doesn't necessarily have to be just one source of repayment, it can sort of be combined. We just look at those sources up front when we're underwriting the, the application. And, it, and I'll add a point to this, you know, when, um, one of the challenges with the operation that, that we had in the in the project was, it's a school of arts that's under the Paramount Theater. It was, Jesse may have mentioned this, it was never expected to be a profit center. Uh, it's, it's a community benefit that's delivered to the community. Um, and so we had to look outside of, you know, not just within the project. Yes, the, the restaurant, which is a third party, uh, pays a lease and there's revenue generated through that structure. But, but um, we had to look outside of, let's say, the operations of the building um, to be able to, contribute money back to the city so the city could pay back that Section 108 loan. Yeah. Great, yes. So, you know, the other lesson learned I wanted to leave folks with, um, I've also emphasized this point, um, 
uh, use, the structure we used had some additional complexity. I think Kirk and I would absolutely do it again because it got us to this outcome and it was essential to the financial feasibility. But we would also definitely not do it without our favorite attorney who got us through the process. And um, the fact that there were some forced deadlines certainly um, was a huge help and we wouldn't ignore it. If we were doing this again, we would acknowledge that, that these, this takes longer when we, when we add these level, levels of complexity and that, um, that there's just some, some factors to weigh when choosing a structure here and whether it's the right for every, pro whether that's the right decision for every project, I think is really a case by case thing that needs to be evaluated um, because, uh, you know, we like to pride ourselves at TCB that, that we like complexity, that we're all, we're all in for it, but this certainly took us uh, more energy, more time, and um, more brain cells than, uh, than the typical TCB project. Um, great, I think we're ready for the last slide, please. Um, and just to say, you know, um, we, yeah, we really enjoyed the opportunity to get to talk this through and, and look forward to kind of a little bit more dialogue here. Wanted to provide our contact information if anyone wants to reach us directly. You're very welcome to do that. And, um, you know, it's just always a pleasure to talk about this project that has become a vibrant home for performing arts and a critical housing resource. And uh, this, is, this, is, this is how we got there. And um, we, we love, you know, sharing kind of how, how we got here so that other, others can make projects like this possible. So look forward to hearing where you all want to take the conversation next. Jesse, it looks like we do have a question, and I'm, I'm jumping in, Madeline, if, if you're... Please, uh, yes. Please do. The, sure. but, but I'll just go ahead and answer. Um, one of the questions is, uh, what are the pros and cons of being both the CDE and the developer? Um, yeah. It's a good question. I could tell you just from a project standpoint, and Jesse might be able to elaborate from a financial standpoint, but from a project standpoint, there were definitely some some economies of scale, so to speak, or synergies by being both the developer and the CD. Um, TCB had an allocation of new markets tax credits. And uh, while we didn't have enough allocation for this project, uh, it, um, it at least gave us, let's say, sort of like, think about like a, uh, somebody searching for an uh, investor to invest in a business, right? It, um, if it's sort of like, you know, there's already money in the bank or an allocation committed, it makes it easier, it made it easier for us to go and, and find a co-CDE that was willing to join in instead of looking and hunting for um, one or multiple CDEs to, to fill the whole pot. It also allowed us to control our destiny with how we were managing our project financing uh, and our funds very early on before we had that co-CDE, Bimo Harris, on board. Uh, because we, you know, as Jesse elaborated, <laughs> Jesse is, and her team, you know, we have ownership of the entire financial structure. So we knew early on um, how to pair the, let's say, the outcome, the goals, the objectives with what we want to achieve with all the things we have to do early on financially to be able to position it properly without saying we've got a great idea and now let's go shop for a co-CE that can let's say, educate and lead the financial charge because with a project of this complexity um, that would have added more complexity by not having that, that intelligence and ownership uh, under one umbrella with the development side of the equation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I agree with all that. And I can add a few thoughts. And I see that part of the um, question in the chat also um, alludes to the, or asks, you know, they, that they understand that CDE application asks if the CDD will be a allocating towards their own projects, and is it typically more competitive not to fund your own projects? And that's a great question. Um, so that, that's, that's absolutely true. And um, TCB, let me say it this way, TCB really wears three hats in the world of, of new markets. Um, we do some new markets development. We also do new markets development consulting for smaller nonprofits um, who may not have the capacity to do all the development functions, but who want to own and operate a facility using the program. And then that third hat is the CDE hat. Now, this project, you know, I, I put it more in that second category. We really are doing this project on behalf of ACCA, who will be operating the facility, um, and they will be the long-term user and ultimately will own the project. Now, it's a bit of a hybrid because we, um, we do have um, a minority owner. TCB has a minority ownership interest um, through the life of the New Markets Project to kind of help facilitate the financing and to facilitate some of the connections with the LIHTC project that were needed for guarantees. Um, so. This project is able to um, 
helped kind of meet a, an ownership profile that allowed us to invest and to kind of meet our own definition and the definition that we promise, or that our CDE promises to the CDFI fund relative to um, our involvement on both sides. So we're more a min minority owner, um, but it is, a, it is permissible um, for us to be on both sides of the project. But um, typically, TCB CDE is funding projects that are in neighborhoods where TCB is working on housing, but not projects that TCB is developing directly. We, we use our allocation as a way to bring in an additional resource to a community. And really, this project is in that, that identical spirit. You know, we are a housing operator that is doing 38 units that happen to be directly above the project, as well as the 38 units uh, a few blocks away that Kirk showed on the map, the Coulter Court project. And then below us is the School for Performing Arts that is going to be operated by our partner, ACCA. Um, so we're just thrilled that we can bring um, the CDE side of, our, of what TCD does as a resource to make this project possible. Yeah, there are a couple more questions that have come in. Um, one was, um, did core portions of the project generate other private investment in surrounding area? Great question. Uh, I uh, would love to say that the project can take credit for um, generating other projects in the area, and I, I would say it, it partially can. There was already within the downtown, as you know, we showed in the slides, uh, a lot of momentum, a lot of investment, and in, in, uh, a lot of positive benefits that have been happening in the downtown uh, area before uh, we did this project. But I, I will say this, when, when we embarked on the project, we looked at literally probably a half dozen different sites. Uh, and Aurora's, uh, to its benefit, has just um, beautiful historical buildings in its downtown that were ripe for redevelopment that had been sitting vacant for many years. And after we had completed this project, I can, you know, um, thankfully say that, that all of those buildings, there's about four other historic buildings that we had looked at strongly and strongly considered, have all uh, are either completed or had started development to convert to do adaptive reuse projects into various uses, but primarily market rate housing, which is another thing that we were um, hoping to help spur in the downtown. So I would like to say that the project has has had an impact on that revitalization effort that was well underway. I'd like to say, you know, Aurora Art Center has acted as a catalyst to help with the revitalization effort in downtown. There is interest, Kirk, in um, kind of all the moving pieces here and um, in the mechanics. So another question that came in is, how does this project get serviced with so many lending and grant components? I can take some of that if you want, Kirk, and feel free to put your perspective if you want. Um, you know, Jessica, if you don't mind going to the structure diagram for a second again, that was towards the towards my part of the um, presentation. I can't remember what slide, but you know, I'll answer it this way. Um, perfect. You, you know, new markets projects have a flow of funds that is as is kind of required. It's almost um, like I would say it this way, and I don't know. There may be others in the call who who have more new markets expertise and who would say it differently. But um, there's a bit of a kind of a tax charade that we have to have to, to show that we are. Um, servicing uh, loans. However, in this project, um, none of the sources of funds really required repayment. That, that was not the business intent of any of the soft loans um, or, or the grants, you know, were, were given as such. They were grants uh, to a nonprofit, and so as such, they don't require any um, servicing. But um, what does require, what, what, what does require to show servicing is um, really a lot of these arrows on this chart are, are required to show um, uh, you know, debt service payments between these various entities from a tax standpoint. So um, there are a lot of flows that are on a quarterly basis. We're making payments from one entity to the next. Um, so, you know, uh, the Qualic B is making a payment up to the CDEs, who are technically its lender. Uh, the CDEs are making a payment up to the investment fund. The investment fund is making a payment up to the leveraged lender. The leveraged lender has to make a payment back to the master tenant. Um, the master tenant originally had to pay a bridge loan, which then eventually got paid off. Uh, the master tenant is getting its money from its subtenant, which is actually after the user. Anyway, you get the idea. There's, um, there is this flow of funds, but just to leave it kind of high level, um, unless, unless anyone wants to ask a more detailed question, um, it's really all on paper. It's kind of all just to be um, kosher with the tax structure, but it doesn't, for, on a business, the business intent was um, really that all those sources are coming in with no required repayment. 
And, and I'll add to that, Jesse, you know, there's really maybe two ways to think about it. It's everything Jesse just explained within the project structure, but then outside of the project structure, uh, um, the city still has its obligation back to HUD to repay the Section 108 loan. And so what, what added to the complexity of the transaction, not just everything that Jesse talked about with this, uh, this uh, workflow diagram with who is responsible to who, but then uh, related to the project, but again, technically outside of the project, um, the community builders uh, and the city had to set up a, a relationship and separate agreements to establish that the project wouldn't be encumbered by, let's say, the, the Section 108's repayment requirements because that, that wouldn't work with because the project wasn't generating enough revenue. And that's why we explained a little bit ago why the repayment sources for the Section 108 loan are actually coming from other various sources that aren't necessarily within the project. Uh, but also it does also lead into in terms of who's responsible or who who's guaranteeing all this. And so TCB carries a certain uh, amount and different, uh, let's say, um, levels of responsibility as the developer and as the Qualic B, the controlling entity of the, the Qualic B during the new, mat, new markets tax credit compliance period. We have obligations to ensure that we're, we're performing as we had committed to comply and to keep all of these investments uh, and the, you know, the, uh, these structures in place. Uh, separately, outside the project, we have an agreement with the city of Aurora to ensure that, let's say, the city is um, holding the obligation to repay the Section 108 loan. That actually doesn't come back on the community builders. So there's, there's a lot of uh, uh, inter-party relationship or agreements that had to be set up uh, to ensure that, that um, the risk profile for one, any one entity, any one partner within the uh, within the structure or within the, the project itself wasn't unduly encumbered, so to speak, outside of what it could control. Yeah. You know, I'll add, I'll just say um, something, that it, I'll say it a different way that um, something that Kirk and I have both said, just in case this is a helpful way to, to hear it. Um, you know, a project like this that, that would, would support performing debt, be it Section 108 or some other source, that flow of funds that I was talking about that's really on paper for this project would be in the form of like that qualic B, um, you know, having a, having a revenue stream so that, you know, ACA is operating a school for performing arts. And if this deal was designed such that they were supposed to be making a profit and have the ability to service debt, we would see all those same payments, but ultimately the leverage lender would actually be paying back somebody um, monthly that, um, that was true debt service. So, you know, that's the way a new markets project can work that has supportable debt. Um, but just on this project, it was acknowledged from the beginning that that's not the expectation with the School of Performing Arts. They do fundraising in order to just operate, and it wasn't the ability to then also um, place a debt burden on them. So um, that was, you know, understood and supported by the city from the beginning, as we've talked about. It, it might be helpful to, to just hit the pause button on that and just make a comment about, like, in terms of taking it from a concept to a, a completed project and how to all this stuff come together, you know, there's part of it, it does feel like the stars aligned on this project in terms of having, um, like Jesse said in lessons learned, having all the committed partners with the, the expertise to be able to ensure it, it move forward. But the other was just that, that those partners um, were flexible in, in troubleshooting, problem solving along the way, um, because there, um, there's so many different ways to, to get, uh, you know, to get this thing accomplished. And I, I kid you not, I, I remember being on a call two weeks before our like you know, absolute cliff deadline. And it's in the evening and we are on a call with a bunch of attorneys and HUD and all the way up the leadership at HUD with their attorneys problem solving for some technical issue that had to be addressed to get the, the Section 108 funding to the city and into the project so we could actually close on the project before the end of the year. And it was pretty, I mean, not pretty, it was extremely impressive to see the committed partner, like, I mean, and I kudos to HUD on, because they were committed to, to ensuring that the Section 108 was proud of this project, and it wasn't easy. Um, and there was mm -hmm. truly, you know, a lot of, a lot of um, heavy lifting that had to be done by many parties, but it was, it was neat to see the commitment of all those parties together trying to go for that common goal. Yeah, um, and I'll add a little bit to that, Kirk, and I think that's, you know, HUD commitment to providing the assistance necessary to help their grantees really 
um, navigate the Section 108 program successfully is is evident by you know all of the resources that they're making available through different types of trainings like this webinar series and also just wanted to highlight that um, there is that technical assistance help being offered um, through the Section 108 folks that had um, two of whom are on the call today and are more than happy to um, address any additional questions um, on the specifics of the program. So um, just wanted to make sure that we're underscoring that the commitment to that technical assistance is there from HUD to make these projects successful. Um, we have another question in um, asking whether TCB has used Section 108 on other projects. Um, before um, and whether this project is in an OZ in particular and whether um, you view Section 108 in conjunction with um, OZ funds. Sure, yeah. Um, so, you know, I mentioned that I was a little skeptical coming into this and I'm really glad to have been proven wrong about um, the, the, whether Section 108 would work for this project. Um, and um, one of the reasons that I have emphasized um, in, in kind of what I talked about here was that we early on acknowledged together with the city that um, that this project um, needed an alternative collateral and repayment source. Um, it's because I'd hit that hurdle elsewhere um, when we've tried when we've looked at projects to use Section 108 funds. Um, you know, I just think that, that the program is fantastic for for its intent, and then there are certain project profiles which just don't match, right? If you already have a first mortgage and a lie tech project, and um, you're not trying to look outside the project, then this generally, generally, and actually the HUD folks can correct me if you've seen other structures where that's been successful, but you know, generally that's probably not the right the right time to use Section 108. Um, so actually, in my experience, we have not used 108 in recent years. Not I don't know of a project that that TCB has has done, has had other experience. So this really is our, our key experience um, and it's been a, a terrific one. In terms of the OZ side of this, um, I believe if, if anyone wants to correct me, you can, that um, the OZ, the OZ um, regs kind of were coming out uh, right, maybe right as we were closing or right after we closed. So we did not take advantage of OZ on this project. And I actually, as a result of the, of the timing of when OZ the, the ozone program was established. I actually don't even know if we're in an ozone. I don't know, Kirk, if you we're happen to. We're not in an ozone. Okay. okay. Um, so, so yeah. So, so you know, TCB has um, had a few projects that have benefited from being in ozones. These were LIHTC projects where we had a LIHTC investor who um, did have capital gains. You know, it's actually common that a lot of our go-to LIHTC investors don't. And as a result, it can be hard. We, we've just found, found it sometimes hard to mix OZ and LIHTC, um, but we have had two really successful projects where um, our investor is able to use both those sources. And that is our experience with OZ to date. And if you want to learn a little bit more about um, OZs and potential for twinning, um, we had a webinar that is, um, the recording will be posted um, on the HUD exchange. We had it last week where we talk through OZ, historic tax credits, and the Section 108 program, just some of the kind of high-level mechanics of it. So if you're interested in learning more about that um, and potential for twinning, um, please uh, check out that particular resource. Um, any other questions with, from folks um, participating here? We've got lots of, of uh, different ex experts on the line that we could um, get to your questions. Uh, we've got one actually that just came in. Um, what would you say to be the top three lessons learned to help others that have never used Section 108 before? Uh, you know, just um, from my viewpoint as the project manager and not necessarily being in the city's shoes, but watching them navigate the Section 108 process, couple takeaways that I had, again, as an outsider's perspective. Number one is uh, it is important to have uh, representation with expertise, whether that be in-house. The city of Aurora is very fortunate that they, uh, they had um, qualified and, and uh, expertise in-house that could navigate the process, not necessarily knowing the nuances of the section way, but in terms of navigating that. Uh, or if you don't have it in-house, it's, it's have appropriate or have qualified outside representation uh, to help navigate it. Um, you know, that, that's one big lesson learned. Um, 
that I that I saw from the city. Jesse, I don't know if you have some other lessons learned on the Section 108. You know, I think the things that I've already talked about from our from my perspective as you know, kind of financial structure on the developer side, where my kind of biggest observations, and I think you've, you've you know, I've probably hit those home enough. Just sort of the, um, the thinking about our timeline in a sequential way with the city's backstop, and um, and uh, you, you know, I think that that was a huge theme. And, and and I also just would also just do one more voice to just say how valuable the technical assistance from HUD was. You know, Kirk and I weren't directly on very many of those calls. I think we did meet the technical assistance provider a couple of times to help, you know, with some of the dialogues about the structure of the deal and for coordination. Um, you know, you're, I guess, you know, you're hearing from us as the developers, so we, we weren't actually um, in the sausage making part of the Section 108 underwriting. Um, but I think that we, we know from talking with our city partners how, how um, critical those that, that TA was, and I think um, just you know having an expert who has seen different structures and can really bring some creative juice to bear um, is, is really a big part of what was successful here. And I, I'll tag on tag on or tag team on just one of the things you just said, Jesse. You know the timeline was important. I remember us being advised by our council that we didn't want to push too fast and hard on let's say our other aspects of financing until we had the section 108 at a level of confidence or level from the city or a commitment level that then allowed us to then push forward the new markets transaction because it really is it's um, when you get the team together and, and I kid you not it's probably a dozen to two dozen attorneys on the phone for with these weekly closing calls especially with the new this transaction and the complexity that what we didn't want to do was start that momentum and have a you know the slow moving ship to go to closing and when you have to make a quick turn it, it can't turn quickly and okay. so that momentum you know let's say um, timing out and thinking through all of the components if you're looking at another your own project is working out the the workflow and the timeline for each of those sources and then making sure you have certain decision points or commitments along the way to then allow let's say the other pieces to move forward um, because the, the biggest one of the big threats we had was to advance a whole bunch of let's say you know the nine percent transaction the traditional new markets tax credit transaction but then not have these key components you know um, advancing at the same pace because it, it literally could have turned into a house of cards if we didn't think through each of those pieces and we ended up at the finish line but we were missing one little piece Mm -hmm. And then the whole thing went all out there. Mm -hmm. um, there are a couple more questions that have come in. One, I think, is um, here is, did U.S. Bank have any role beyond investor? Sure. Um, you know, U.S. Bank uh, was, I think, investor is the way to describe their role. However, they were investor in, I believe, uh, five tax credits. Let me count them as I say them. Um, so new markets, um, federal historic. Illinois River's Edge credit, and we actually multiplied that by two because we had that on the LiTech project and the New Markets project, and they were the LiTech investor as well. Um, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, ahead. one more credit. Yes, thank you. I knew there was one more. The Illinois Affordable Housing Tax Credit, also known as the Donation Tax Credit, um, that I mentioned was generated associated with the housing side of this project. It's an equity source that um, that can be kind of used flexibly once it's syndicated. So it's also it's in the commercial project. They were also the investor in that credit. So we saw them on a lot of a lot of sides of this project. Thanks for that. And I think this is a little bit of a follow-on in terms of all the different sources, but um, this person is curious about how complicated the exit plan is for either the commercial or housing project where things are intertwined. Yeah, I love that question. Um, so you know, you know, Kirk, I, I would say that the intertwining of the projects is less complicated, right? The intention is for TCB to be the owner of the housing and for ACA to operate the School for Performing Arts and to be the long-term owner of that space. Um, and really, the, yeah, I'll, I'll say this and, and tell me if you where, where you want to go, Kirk, or what, what you want to add to this. Um, you know, the, the new markets unwinds are complicated in their in their in their own way. So um, we're a few years, just a few years away now, like seven years at that fast, um, from uh, kind of dealing with that. But the business plan, the business um, the business deal here and, and what will occur is that ACA, who is now technically a, a, a lessee of the space, or sorry, a less, uh, yeah, uh, they, they lease the space, they're the tenant, um, they will become the, the, the owner of the space once the unwind occurs and um, 
and that's you know that's intention and then tcb you know we will be getting us bank out in 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 and around year 15 um and then we would have control of the housing portions of this project and so we will we will be two parties owning two um parts you know two condos within a building and there's a condo um kind of condo association that dictates how we work together on thinking about shared costs and kirk i don't know if you want to pick anything up related to that uh, i would uh perfectly said i would say you know conversely the the unwind the exit uh, because it, it's uh, it, it, because of that kind of structure, it does simplify, let's say, the you know the nine percent transaction almost being on its own from let's say the the commercial project, the new markets project. The more the unwind is almost uh, sort of the easy part compared to how we um, wound it up in the first place. Because as we were advancing these projects, um, going back to the house of cards uh, analogy, um, we we had to make a risk assessment and a commitment to this project um, before we actually apply for a nine percent tax credit so as, it, as most folks may know they're those are competitive and once those are allocated um it's, it's really if for an organization like tcb you know we're we're all in uh, because if we return those credits that really is a from us reputationally and also just it impacts our housing authority the illinois housing development authority if we had to return those credits and so we had to ensure that we had a plan in place, and it, I wouldn't call it an exit plan, but a contingency plan, if something didn't go right early on in the project. When we when we had applied for tax nine percent tax credits, we actually had to have a completely separate project underwritten and a game plan developed that if the new markets project fell apart, we were still able to accomplish or complete the, the housing portion of the, the project. And then simply put, we had a plan and we had revenue sources identified to at least white box the lower floors so it could sit almost like a, a you know a, its own condominium but a commercial um you know just like a commercial retail uh, space that would sit vacant until it could be repurposed or that project could let's say get kick-started again uh, and we had you know vice versa we had to, we had to play with this all the way through the project so um it was just a little interesting comment to make thinking through the exit versus the enter portion of the project Thanks, Kirk. Um, this, we're shifting gears a little bit, and we're happy to come back to the details of the program uh, of this particular project. But um, another question has come in, and it's directed to HUD um, staff. At what point in the development of a project is it best to request technical assistance from HUD? Um, and then the follow-on question to that is: it, uh, ever, Is it too early if we ask for assistance before any fun other funding sources are secured? So uh, maybe Joey or Jorge, you can address that question. Sure, <clears throat> I can. I can address it, and then Jorge can chime in. But I think we're both going to say you come to HUD for technical assistance as early um, as you can. I think HUD HUD works well at the beginning of a project in the concept phase, so that we can help provide direction on where Section 108 might best fit within the project. Uh, we can also provide some of those. Um, just insight into potential pitfalls or just uh, a heads up on other documentation that you may need or want to prepare for as you're getting ready to include other sources of financing. Um, so I'd say we work well on the early side of the project and then if you want to come to HUD with any draft application as the project is maybe a little bit more baked, um, you can come to HUD, turn in a draft application, we're happy to review any of that material before you all send in the official the official application and then that way by the time the official application is ready and the other financing sources are more locked in uh, the approval process should be a little bit more condensed so I'm not sure if Jorge has anything to add but to sum up I would say come to HUD as early as possible you, you said it all Joey that's that's the bottom line come to us as soon as possible and and then as as the uh, project progresses, uh, the frequency is, or the frequency of those uh, meetings will become uh, uh, more and more until you have a successful uh, project. So come to us as soon as possible. 
Yeah, and I think you both made a really good point in last week's webinar, which is that you could go to HUD for technical assistance, not only around some of the finer points on the financing and strategies, but also to um, get some assistance just kind of on the higher level programmatic eligibility type questions, um, national objectives and, and things of that nature. So it, it is kind of a holistic um, uh, assistance that HUD, tech, uh, the technical assistance team is providing. Yeah, and I have one more <clears throat> item that sort of goes back to one of the questions earlier about uh, documentation and who's responsible for what. I think what HUD can do during that initial phase as the city is still trying to figure out all the different financing sources and, um, you know, if we are going to use new markets, as TCB has been saying, a lot of these other financing sources have some party who is responsible for doing what uh, in terms of documentation kind of baked into the program. And so kind of the same for HUD, we can really help walk through what are the documentation requirements that need to be fulfilled for the Section 108 and help identify who on staff would be the best person to have that role. Typically, Section 108 is handled through IDIS um, similar to CDBG, so we could walk through the IDIS compliance and what exactly needs to happen uh, in the IDIS system so that uh, you're all up to date with your Section 108 documentation. So I would say coming to us early allows us to, to figure out and identify those who, on staff who are going to be responsible for what in terms of documentation and compliance, and then that way as other sources of financing come in, um, you sort of know who's on first at least with the HUD funding. Thanks, Joey. Um, just kind of keeping on the TA theme here, um, one of our participants was curious as to who the HUD 108 TA provider or partner was for this project. And I don't know if that's a Kirk question or a HUD question, or maybe we could follow up with folks after. I think it was National Development Council, but I could be wrong. I honestly can't recall, but we, we can find out and uh, let everybody know. Great. But also, uh, I'd like to say that uh, we are in the staff, the Section 108 uh, Financial Management Division, which is uh, the office that manages the Section 108 program for HUD, uh, is more than willing and available to assist uh, any of the uh, grantees or recipients or possible borrowers. So uh, you can call us direct and we'll will be more than glad to, to assist you. Thanks, Jorge. Um, are there any other uh, questions? Because I have a few more here that we could get into. Just wanted to make sure that we're, we're keeping those questions flowing in the chat. Um, but uh, the one that I have here is, um, how did you balance the communications aspect of this project? Clearly, there were a lot of moving parts. Um, but who is responsible for keeping all those pieces aligned? Um, and in relation to that, is there something you would have done differently? Um, or is there something that you would say absolutely replicate on your next project? Uh, it's a great question. Um, I, my responsibility as the project manager, I was serving as the quarterback uh, with communication. Um, but it wasn't just me. We, we had a, uh, called, um, you know, there was three of us at TCB, Jesse Elvin, myself, and a colleague of mine on our, our development team, Jesse Schnell. Uh, the three of us were really the, the three um, co-project managers to ensure this project before because there was just so much heavy lifting. And I, and I think it was really, we, we you know, if anyone's done closings uh, or real estate transactions, being organized with your closing calls and uh, communicating often, um, whether it be attorney to attorney or let's say, you know, on the business side, uh, development and finance teams to, to you know, so the investor business folks. Um, but um, I would say we were very blessed on this project where from the very start, whether it was working with the city of Aurora in terms of being very symbiotic with, with the goals and, and what we were trying to accomplish to um, 
finding and securing our co-CBE partner, BMO Harris, to um, let's say um, capturing our uh, finding our investor, U.S. Bank, and all the other uh, stakeholders and partners. We were very blessed that that went well, and I think where everyone had that common goal was was important because I think if we had a stakeholder that had a different agenda, that it, it literally probably would have derailed the project and it would have been able to be successful. I would absolutely just echo what you said. And I also just, um, I don't know, I want to give a shout out to my colleague, Kirk. I mean, I think a strong project management lead is a big part of how we got here and that was Kirk. And I think having a strong team, which included our legal team for sure, who not only had great expertise on help having you know the legal technical matters here, but also they really brought a lot of um, skill in, in an efficient process. I would say that um, helped us to think about the right sequence of events and when to bring things up, when to when, for example, to bring the light tech and new markets teams together, when to not do that because it was a waste of people's time. You know, there's a lot of decisions like that around efficiency that I think um, we relied on some outside parties to help us with, um, and. Uh, I guess I would maybe just add that, you know, TCB's structure is a little bit different than a lot of our colleague developers, um, and that, that's really the team that, I, that, I, that I'm on is um, sort of an addition um, to what we're often accustomed to seeing in some of our other development companies. Um, so we have a, de a development finance department that, you know, as we've described, kind of partners with our development team on, um, on all of our projects, and I think a project like this is a really great case study for why we have the structure we have, because um, for Kirk to have that support, um, given all these moving pieces, I think that that is what set us up for success as well. Agreed, and, and I, I will just comment, I am, uh, I am not a subject matter expert in these topics, but having Jesse at my side and Jesse Snell and all of our team literally in this together where, where you could dive deep with just a, a, a simple email or a phone call was instrumental. And, I, and just to be very specific, our legal representation was Applegate, Thorne, Thompson in Chicago, and they, they brought the absolute A team to the game, which was helpful, like I said, to be creative and thinking outside the box to help get the skills structured effectively and efficiently. Um, so to follow up a little bit, there's a, there's a couple of learning curve questions here. Um, were both your legal and tax firms already familiar with the Section 108 program, or did they have a learning curve there? And then as a follow-on to that, um, one of the questions I was curious about is whether the city staff, um, if this was their first project, uh, 108 project, or if they had had experience with it before. Great. You know, um, let's see. I think, and Kirk, you tell me if you have a different perspective. I think that our legal team, um, and accounting team were, were familiar with Section 108, had done projects like this, but I, or had done projects with Section 108, but I'm not sure that they had seen it used quite in this way, because um, I, I don't know how many times this has actually been done. Um, so I think that there were some things for them to learn, but they were the type of team that was equipped because of their past experience was broad enough that this was not a major learning curve for them. They had enough similar fact patterns to refer to from their, their past that they were able to figure out the key issues pretty quickly. Um, and I do think, and I'll, Kirk, I'll let you take this, but I, I believe this was the city of Aurora's first experience with the program. Uh, so yes, it was the city's first Section 108 loan, and uh, our our legal team, Applegate, Thorne, Thompson, and TCB, we have uh, in-house legal as well. Um, uh, but specifically, Applegate, I know they they had worked on other projects, similar projects, but I remember just you know as we got to know folks who were saying that this one at the time took the cake. Uh, with, with having the most complexity or, you know, the most unique features to it that they hadn't worked on uh, before. But I do know since then they've worked on other projects like this. So this, I would say, relative to, to where the industry is today and the creativity that can be applied to, to accomplishing projects like this, this is not unique anymore. Um, and it's something that, you know, we would hope we could do again. I mean, it's one of those... You don't want to do them every day because you've got, you've got to have a life outside of work, uh, at least for 18 months or two years. But um, uh, but it's something that now I feel as though we are, um, you know, we're empowered through this experience to be able to, like Jesse said, the three approaches that we take when we do new markets work, to work with other nonprofits. Um, um, we just received a new allocation of new markets tax credits. 
Um, and you know, so wh whatever that role is, um, I think it's just added to our, you know, let's say our skill set that we can then deliver to for other other uh, communities or other clients that have needs. Do you know? Uh, I'm, I'm happy um, to oh yes, go ahead, Jorge. Yes, uh, I think the the most important thing is not so much as the legal team having a, a, an experience with Section 108. I mean, they have to be totally expert on, on the new market tax credit program because in terms of the Section 108, uh, the challenge is to, uh, once the funds are inserted into the program, then all the uh, Section 108 and CDBG requirements has to flow through all the way to the quality B, to the business. So having many entities and um, passing those requirements or ensuring that those requirements are, are passed down to the agreement level, to the quality B, that is the, the challenge, but not so much as uh, uh, expertise. It's more of a, a coordination, uh, having our Office of Legal or our program attorneys providing the necessary requirement requirements to be included into those documents that flow down to the public B. That will be that I'll say that is the challenge, but with a strong leadership from the developer that can coordinate all the entities, that that is done with no problem. Thanks, Jorge. Um, just following on a little bit, um, so who was the, the entity that decided to pursue the Section 108 um, funds for this project? Um, and I think maybe, Kirk, you covered it at the beginning in terms of the primary reasons and kind of what we're seeing on the screen is the redevelopment and revitalization of this part of the city. But um, so, yeah, who, who really kind of instigated bringing the Section 108 funds into this project? Uh, that was the city of Aurora. So, so early on in the concept phase, when when the city outlined what they were trying to accomplish, and we were looking at different sites, we were probably went through a dozen, um, you know, probably a dozen deep dives with different underwriting scenarios and different approaches that we could do to help them. Some involved the School of Arts, some did not. And, but, but once we identified, okay, you know, here are here's a potential structure. We identified what the the need, financial need would be, and then that's when the city, again, we weren't, you know, behind their curtain, but that's when then they came back to, well, you know, we've identified, you know, whether it be CDBG or TIF, and we haven't, and that's when they, they brought forth that, hey, we're exploring Section 108 alone. Um, and that was early in the process where then we were like, okay, now that we understand these, that's then allowed us to then, you know, problem solve or troubleshoot what the mixing all these different sources were together that ultimately led to the transaction diagram that Jesse shared, you know, with all the complexity and, you know, there's a little bit of oil and water with some of these sources, for example, why the state historic tax credit, the River Edge credits couldn't be in the leverage, um, you know, in the leverage that dashed box. Um, but it, likewise, that helped us identify the hurdles or the challenges with them bringing in a section 108 loan. And then very early on, us with the city and then the city with, with HUD, or their TA, we're able to then understand and then we could go through, okay, what are the issues or challenges? And then we could problem solve on those, those issues early on without waiting to, let's say, the 11th hour when we've put the whole deal together and it's fully baked to then try to figure it out. Thanks, Kirk. Um, I'm going to put out a call for any additional questions um, from participants. The last call for questions. You can put them in the chat. I'll pause here for a second. All right, giving folks enough time to type them in if you need. Okay, well, um, this has been an amazing conversation with you, Kirk and Jesse, today. Um, and we really congratulate the city of Aurora for um, embarking on a Section 108 program or project that is so ambitious. It has had beautiful results, as we could all see. 
Um, thank you to TCB for being willing to to uh, miss out on your holidays um, to <laughs> make these projects happen because these kinds of projects really do make all the difference in, in communities. So we thank uh, the city, we thank uh, TCB, and we also thank HUD for their deep engagement in these projects um, and want to make sure that folks know that uh, HUD, the HUD team doors are open on a variety of fronts for this kind of um, help with the Section 108 program. Um, so for um, all of us here at LISC who have been working with HUD and others on the Section 108 series, um, thank you for participating today. All of the series um, webinars and guides and case studies will be available and, and on the HUD exchange um, on the Section 108 page with, uh, under the resources. So feel free to kind of download and um, and peruse those. Um, and we really do encourage you um, that are out there that are contemplating these projects to take advantage of the, um, the resources available through HUD to, to make these projects happen. So with that, thank you to all of our presenters today. Amazing uh, presentation. And thank you to all of you who took the time today to learn more about this project and the process. So thank you all and have a good rest of the afternoon. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank